when a spotlight is introduced onto a mangrove, everything else literally disappears. It becomes this overpowering experience where everything else literally fades to black and your whole world becomes this object. My name is Matt Stock and welcome to my exhibition titled Painting with Light at the Palm Beach Photographic Center. The images that you're going to see stretch across nearly a decade of work involving light painting, which is the technique of capturing, in my case, many images shot over many hours using a variety of light sources. And we're gonna talk about how I use those light sources to capture these images. Light painting is a technique of capturing long exposure images and then by using continuous light sources and occasionally strobes over these long exposures to introduce light in really novel ways in a very fluid and active way. So my methodology is to go out into the field and shoot sometimes hundreds of exposures throughout the course of many hours, usually starting at sunset and running well into the evening. And throughout the course of these exposures, I and my team of assistants are on location using a variety of light sources from flashlights to sometimes even the uh, research light on a 120 ton research vessel, airplane lights, car lights, sometimes an iPhone light, anything that can create a source of illumination. So the technique is called painting with light because whoever is moving the light, myself or an assistant, you can visualize it as though you were painting a wall. So instead of a brush, you have a flashlight and you're moving your entire arm up and down, left and right, these big fluid motions. And instead of using pigmented paint, we use light to paint my subjects. And that's what you're seeing and will see in the images in the exhibition at the Palm Beach Photographic Center. The Palm Beach Photographic Center is to me more than just a physical space it represents a community. And the community is not just a local one, but really a global one. At least once a year during Photo Fusion, coming together with fellow artists and photo educators from all over the world presents an opportunity in Palm Beach that is really unique within the greater landscape of the photographic you know, experience. Over the years, my time spent in Palm Beach has allowed me to travel and explore with my photography. A lot of the work, I'm chasing down rumors. Sometimes I'll hear from a boat captain that there's a shipwreck or a plane wreck that I have to go out and photograph that he thinks I will absolutely love. Sometimes I'll hear from somebody who spends countless hours out in the Everglades, and she'll say, oh, you need to go out and photograph this abandoned vehicle. Have you heard about this spot? So as with most things, um, I think really relying on and believing in those that are passionate about a specific place and have that local knowledge is, is really key. And that local knowledge and local passion is what has caused me over the course of my career to focus on my beloved South Florida um, and particularly the Everglades and surrounding areas. My time at the Palm Beach Photographic Center as artist in resident over the course of two summers really allowed me to take a deeper dive into some of the more interesting and unique areas of Central Florida that are a part of the Everglades watershed and mangrove estuaries. And I wouldn't have had that chance otherwise. During that time, I was also able to go out and spend a significant period of time by myself in nature. I am most connected with nature 
when I am alone with nature. In this picture of a red mangrove sticking defiantly out of Biscayne Bay, um, it was a real challenge. This was an image that really lived in theory before reality. It was the first time, I believe, that I tried to capture an over-under image with light painting. So what you see in the middle of the frame, that um, illuminated line just above the roots. And by the way, those are the roots at the bottom of the frame. I've heard folks say that it looks like a reflection, and it very well might. But in reality, those are the roots that we're seeing. So we're looking underwater and above water at the same time. And that water line, that smooth line, was uh, another very long exposure, much like I've, I've talked about in my technique. So that was about a 10 minute exposure at the water line, and I illuminated only the water line. Then in subsequent separate exposures, I illuminated underneath the tree and above the tree and illuminated it root by root and leaf by leaf. And so in a single exposure, there may only be five or six leaves illuminated. And then I'll move my light and take another exposure and then move my light and take another exposure. And um, I was very excited when I captured this image. This next image is very special to me. And it is the image titled Elysian Fields 3. With this image in mind, I was looking for an area that had an open field, an open midground, and foreground, and something interesting in the background. I love pine trees and our native Florida pines. So when I saw this area at the edge of um, it looks like a pine hammock, with saw palmettos, which I also love in the foreground, I knew this was my spot. I didn't necessarily have this image in mind the day I set out to go and shoot. It was a persistent goal that I had with me every day. So when you are out photographing, staying open to opportunities, that is something very important, I think, uh, for all photographers to keep in mind when they're shooting, to not be so rigid and to be flexible. When a storm started to roll in early one evening out in the middle of the state, I was with my friend and assistant, Bill Antelek, who is a phenomenal photographer and just amazing guy. Bill helped me grab my lights, and this is definitely, again, a do as I say, not as I do, because this was very dangerous, don't do this. Grab my strobes, and in the middle of a lightning storm, started flashing my strobes and using my flashlights to illuminate the pine trees. So this image is backlit. And really, it's a collaboration between Mother Nature and myself. That's how I, I really thought about this and contextualized it and, and really wanted to create something like this. A lot of the work when it involves the Milky Way or the sunset or the clouds and nature helps me accomplish my vision. Definitely the case here. The lightning is, is the star. And I used my strobes and flashlights to accent it. They became the supporting actors. So I always argue with people when they say lightning never strikes twice. I say, well, actually, lightning strikes four times. I was able to get four different lightning strikes and um, was really thrilled to capture this magical moment. And it's titled Elysian Fields 3 because this is the third strike that evening that I got. And it's called Elysian Fields because the Greeks believed if you were particularly favored by Zeus, you would be struck by lightning. So because this had this field-like quality and kind of an homage to Greek mythology, I call this image Elysian Fields 3. In addition to being fascinated with nature, I am also captivated by what happens to man-made objects and structures 
when they become abandoned, when nature takes hold and takes over once more. What happens to those relics as the seasons turn, decades pass, and nature begins to take over once more? There's something visually and thematically fascinating to me about this you know, theoretical post-apocalyptic landscape. What would happen if we disappear? What would it look like? And to find these objects, these man-made objects in the real world and to get maybe one version of that future reality is fascinating to me. These images could be seen as a metaphorical warning to what will happen to us if we do not take better care of the environment. We are in danger and our society is in danger of becoming nothing but relics abandoned to the wastelands if we don't take active steps This to next image of doing. a 1953 Dodge with a supermoon illuminating it is part of that transition from nature alone into nature and form. And this image is part of a larger body of work called Abandoned Vehicles of the Everglades that I've been working on for several years with my creative partner and fellow Everglades explorer, Charles Kropke. And this body of work won a Night Arts Challenge Grant in 2019. And this body of work consisting of about 60 vehicles over the course of three years is going to be transformed from a series of prints and digital images into a book. And I'm very excited about that. And with this work, I wanted to set a scene and give the viewer a sense of place. So everything that's there is real and on location. The lawn chair was there. The car was definitely there. And this was photographed during a supermoon. And this was the first time I photographed the supermoon and a vehicle. And we went out that night specifically to capture this. So as I have mentioned, there is a lot of planning and theory that goes into it. And I knew exactly where I wanted to be, when I wanted to be there to capture this image. And that distinction is important to me. It's not being in the right place at the right time, because for me, that implies chance. This is not chance. This is intent, being where I wanted to be, when I wanted to be there. And I tracked the path of the moon as it was rising that night and knew it would rise in that top left quadrant. And I wanted to create a sense of lighting, of very theatrical lighting that gave the sense that the moon, along with these other unseen light sources, was illuminating it. You can see by the pattern of shadow on the rock to the right of the um, sign indicating a curve. You can see how the shadows fall on that rock. It is being top lit. And so we stood there and illuminated that rock from the top. I illuminated the back of the Dodge in such a way to give it a sense that it was being backlit by the moon. And then of course, added my own little dramatic flair with lighting on the right and behind the vehicle and all that. But again, really wanted to set the stage for it. And a lot of these vehicles feel mysterious to me. And some of them feel sad. I do anthropomorphize them a bit. I give them a sense of, uh, of human emotion. Um, and I think we connect to these vehicles in that way and to our own vehicles. People care deeply about the vehicles that they entrust the safety of their loved ones to and that take them from point A to point B every day. And so it becomes a little sad to see some of them like this. 
but very, very special to me. And this series will always be very special in my heart. This next image is titled Caterpillar. And the reason for that is it is an early 1930s crank operated Caterpillar tractor. And we can tell that because of the uh, very lively kind of jaunty font that you see uh, on the top of the grill on the tractor, how it does move and undulate like a caterpillar. And back in the day, they were crank operated. So a lot of my work is more pulled back and more environmental portraits. A lot of the work is inspired by um, the Hudson River painter, Albert Bierstadt, and inspired by, in my opinion, one, one of the most amazing landscape photographers uh, around today, Stephen Wilkes who deal with these big sweeping landscapes, and I do too with most of it. But every now and then there is a more intimate story to be told. And I think that's what we find here, that this abandoned tractor to me feels almost like, like a jungle cat. It feels maybe a little predatory even, that it's emerging, it's about to explode out of this growth. And this scene, this overgrown scene is, to me, very Florida. You can see on the left-hand side of the palm tree, these burn marks from a fire that may have been a year, maybe two years ago, but not too much beyond that because of the new growth that we see around it. We don't see a lot of other really large trees. And I think this one also speaks to the mystery of what's out there. Again, just when you think you understand the Everglades, she'll share a new mystery and a new story with you. And it just raises more questions. Why was this left out there? This was a very valuable piece of equipment. Why was it just abandoned? Who abandoned it? And I don't think we'll ever know. I think it's just going to remain a mystery for us to fill in in our minds. The story of man's interaction with the Everglades in South Florida predates the automobile by thousands of years. People have been exploring, living in, living with, and utilizing the Everglades. Going back to the Tequesta and Calus people, thousands of years ago in South Florida. Recently, however, we have had a fundamental shift. And by recently, I mean since the United States was founded. There has been a shift in the way that we view this very fragile landscape to be one as a resource that could be exploited. Parts of it have been turned into high rises, have been drained, and turned into the cities where we live now. However, for the areas that remain, it is crucial that we preserve them for future generations. I wanna take a minute to thank everybody that has helped make what you see here possible. I literally could not do this by myself. And I could not do it without the support of my assistants, friends, family, and places like the Palm Beach Photographic Center. Thank you, Fatima, for being an, an unbelievable mentor, guide, and supporter of my work through my residency with the Palm Beach Photographic Center, through this exhibition, and innumerable other ways. Thank you to the Knight Foundation for my Knight Arts Challenge Grant. The dream of transforming my work into a book could not have been done without you. So to everybody that has helped me along the way and helped make this possible, truly thank you. And I look forward to continuing to work with everybody to go out and have more adventures and create more images.